Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with What I Learned, playing Mahler's First Symphony. This is something, you know, I'm on the road. You can see this, I think, you know, this, you know, things going to bounce a little bit. You know, I mean, things are a little bit less than my usual exalted standard of professionalism. So uh, please excuse me for that. But I was just thinking about, you know, my experiences as an orchestral percussionist. And I just wanted to share some thoughts with you about the first time I played Mahler's First Symphony and some of the interesting things that I figured out. Because, you know, being a percussionist is a wonderful thing if you want to know what's happening inside the orchestra. Because you sit in the back and you do nothing for much of the time and you watch other people and you watch the conductor and you get to see what they're doing. And the first time I played Mahler's First Symphony, was when I was a grad student at Stanford University. Um, I was in something called the Redwood Symphony Orchestra, um, or what was going to become the Redwood Symphony Orchestra. I don't remember exactly if it had a name at that point. It was conducted by a very nice guy who's still out there. His name was Eric Kujowski. Of course, in those days, he was known as Kujowski. Um, that was before he perfected his Eastern European accent. I'm just kidding. He was very nice. I babysat his cat. It was a very neurotic cat. I never saw it. It stayed with me for a week, and I never once saw the critter. It hid somewhere. I don't know where. And it was in a tiny little one-bedroom student apartment. But they, you know, had a pet, no pets policy, and they did inspections. So the cat had to move around whenever it was inspection time. And I got the cat. But this has nothing to do. <clears throat> that has nothing to do with Mahler's first. I was dying to play Mahler's first symphony, of course. Um, because as an amateur percussionist, it was sort of like the holy grail. You know, Mahler symphonies were, you know, just amazing things to do. And uh, the way I got into these orchestras, and I think I've mentioned this before, was I bought a tam-tam. It was Have Tam-Tam Will Travel. It was a crappy tam-tam, I have to say, um, because there weren't a lot of tam-tams hanging out on the peninsula for student purchase at a price I could afford, but I found one. It was kind of small. It was about like, you know, yay big around, you know, and it had belonged, it belonged to a, a mariachi band called Los Banditos. I knew that because it had Los Banditos painted all over it with a bandito in the middle and feathers attached to it. So, uh, you know, you, it was not your typical tam-tam with interesting Chinese characters. This was a Latin American tam-tam. And I, I got the thing, and so I would show up, and I got a bit of a reputation around the peninsula in community orchestras as the guy with the tam-tam with the feathers and the bandito in the middle. But if they wanted a tam-tam, they got me. Because, you know, community orchestras are always looking for violinists, number one, and then, you know, percussionists who have their own equipment because they don't. Um, they don't usually anyway. Um, for the concert, they actually managed to, I think, rent something that was reasonably decent, but at the, the rehearsals and whatnot, they were stuck with Los Banditos and me. So that's how I got into the orchestra. <clears throat> I would show up schlepping my tam-tam, and I mean, I had cymbals and other you know, triangle, basic, basic percussion stuff sitting around, and we would play. Now, Mahler's first is a miracle of orchestration. I mean, all of Mahler's symphonies are, but you learn so much about the, the art of orchestration and timbre, and also the things that orchestras need to be told to do that they don't do naturally. Now, take the very opening of Mahler's first. Some of you may know it begins with one note, an A. It's like seven or eight octaves deep from the highest, highest harmonics in the violin to the lowest note of the double basses. And against that, you hear offstage trumpets. You know, actually, that's the opening clarinets. The trumpets go. That's the trumpets. So you've got three offstage trumpets. They're marked triple piano. But here's the cool thing. You can't play the part triple piano because they're supposed to be as far off stage as they can be. I actually got to conduct them um, during some of these rehearsals. It wasn't much conducting. You just sort of point and they do it. But, but the point is, 
The point is that in order for them to sound triple piano, they have to play forte, even fortissimo. They have to be as far away as you can get them, but they have to be heard triple piano. And then pianissimo, it changes, actually. They're supposed to move around a little bit. But that is a fascinating thing because the timbre of an instrument playing loudly but heard softly is completely different from the timbre of an instrument playing softly. And actually, at the beginning of that symphony, Mahler marked as an option um, that the trumpets could be muted. And I saw it performed that way when Lauren Mazel and the Vienna Philharmonic um, came uh, to Carnegie Hall. They did Mahler first, and they used muted trumpets in the orchestra. They didn't do the offstage business. It was terrible. What a bad idea. There is also a world of difference between muted trumpets playing quietly and open, normal trumpets blasting over the countryside, but being heard as if far away. And that, right away, was my first inkling of the genius of Mahler and what would be in store. And as the rehearsal went on, there were all kinds of marvelous things that I noted. For example, the way he used the harp just to emphasize certain notes in the melodic line or to underline the harmonies. You know, the slow, mysterious solo bass drum part, which I got to play um, in the middle of the what passes for the development section. But some of the really, really cool stuff happened in the funeral march. That funeral march is amazing from the point of view of orchestration, from the muted solo double bass on. But the part that really screwed everybody up, and it really took some time to sort out, was the second part, when the after the middle section, the funeral march comes back, and you know, and it does that oompa band klezmer music. Do, 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 you know, that business. And there's colenio strings. Colenio means you play the strings with the back of the bow, and they're just going click, 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 you know, like that. Except that at one point, Mahler says, bow with the back of the bow. In other words, stroke with the wood of the bow. Well, that makes a sound like a squeaking hinge, which is exactly what Mahler wants, of course. But the violinist looked at that and they just went, oh! And you know, Mahler, Mahler was a footnote guy. He wrote all kinds of little notes to conductors. And in that passage, he has a little footnote, the score that says, no error, really play it with the wood of the bow. I'm not kidding. You know, and, you know, they're all going, eek, squeak, screech, eek. And they're like, oh, my God. And the conductor, you know, and Eric is sitting there, yeah, saying, yeah, that's really what Mahler wants. Do it the way it's written. And it was, it, it, they didn't want to do it. They couldn't bring themselves to do it because they couldn't follow the dynamics either. The other thing that I learned in that particular passage is that most orchestral sections play one dynamic. If they're used to playing together, violins play the first violins, the second violins, you know, and it's Mark Forte, they all play Forte. Well, Mahler doesn't write like that. Mahler, when he divides up the parts, will give each section its own dynamic. And some could be playing Forte, some could be playing piano, um, all at the same time. So, so one of the things that they had to be taught was to ignore what everyone else was doing and only play the part in front of them at the dynamic indicated and have confidence that it was all going to come out okay. So that took some time. That took some time to sort out. And also, um, some violinists famously, when you know, faced with Mahler's you know, colenio bowings, bring a, a bad bow, like a toy bow or a practice bow or some second bow, because they don't want to scrape the varnish off of their bow by playing the way Mahler indicated. So you, have an, you bring an extra so that you don't mind if it gets wrecked, which is actually kind of funny. And actually, scruffy bows are better than beautifully polished bows because they catch more of the string and you get more of that squeaking hinge kind of sound. So, you know, there are these little details that you learn along the way. You know, it's really, really fascinating. And the other thing that I finally understood, you know, at the very, very end of the symphony, when, you know, the very end, is, it's kind of curious. It's an octave drop. Bum, bum. That's the end. It's a very, it's actually, it was one of Handel's most characteristic endings. He, he used it all the time in quick music um, to end something. It's a very final sounding thing. But that octave drop is, I always thought it was very funny. It is funny. It's a humorous sort of, sort of, you know, 
give him the finger kind of ending. Why? Because the very opening of the symphony is a falling forth. Da, da. And then you've got these little bird calls, right? They're going like <whistles> constantly. I mean, it's, it's emotive. It goes throughout the whole symphony. It permeates the symphony in all of its melodic material. Well, that open fourth, which sounds very indes indeterminate, right? <whistles> you know, it sort of hangs out there into space. It doesn't get completed until the final octave of the whole symphony. Think about it. See how final that sounds? You're going, and that's the end. The symphony literally does not end until the last note, and that octave is a development, if you were, an extension of that opening falling forth that starts the whole symphony. Um, and it's so satisfying, it really is. But it's curious at the same time because there is no symphony that ends quite that way. Um, it doesn't, but it was only when I was playing it that I actually got that, that, that final feeling that said to me, wait a minute, that related the last note to the very first and that brought the work full cycle for me. I really learned a lot playing Mahler's first symphony. These are just a few thoughts, a few things that stick out. And I wanted to share them with you now because I'm sitting here in a hotel with very little to do. And I just thought, thought, wow, what a wonderful experience that was to be able to sit in the back of the orchestra in, in most of the Mahler symphonies that I got to play. I did all of them except the eighth. Um, and, and hear how Mahler puts this stuff together. It's, it's an extraordinary experience. And um, I, I hope that this gives you a few things also, perhaps when you listen to the symphony, you'll listen to it maybe with a little bit of uh, fresh ears for some of the amazing sounds that Mahler makes and the complexity and, and extraordinary individual and collective virtuosity it requires to perform them well, perform them at all. So keep on listening, friends. I'm sorry for the unstable base here that I'm talking from. You know, if I'm moving around, here we go. There we are. Take care. <laughs>